STDs are sexually transmitted diseases. In some parts of the world they call them STIs, sexually transmitted infections. But all we're really talking about is uh, a set of diseases that are typically transferred through intimate physical contact, uh, venereal disease. So some of the ones that I'm gonna go into detail about are like the protozoal STDs, fungal STDs, and so on. But before we get into any specific kinds of STDs, I just want to mention something that a lot of people aren't aware of, and that is many of these STDs can be asymptomatic. That just means that you can contract the disease, but not show any of the symptoms. And this makes STDs really hard to eliminate, really hard to eradicate, because if you, have, if you have sex with somebody and you contract an STD but you don't know you have it because you don't show any of the symptoms, you could then pass it on to somebody else and they could show the symptoms. And they wouldn't know where they got it from and you wouldn't know where they got it from because you never realized that you had that disease as well. So it's kind of scary, the fact that sometimes it's, they can be asymptomatic. It makes it pretty scary. So even if you don't think you have any STDs, if you are sexually active, if you are, you know, doing it, I would recommend every so often to just go to the doctor and get checked out, make sure that there's nothing, you know, to worry about. The first kind of STD that I wanted to talk about are bacterial STDs. These would include things like chlamydia, which is highly infectious and can affect both sexes. It can actually cause sterility. Uh, then there's gonorrhea, where in males this will cause a pus-like discharge to be excreted from the penis and there's going to be a lot of painful urination. And then there's syphilis, which is initially going to be relatively painless. Like there's not going to be much, you know, to worry about initially. But if you don't get it treated, if, if you go for a long time without seeking treatment for syphilis, it will eventually cause severe pain, can even cause blindness, paralysis, mental illness, or even death. When it comes to fungal STDs, the only one I really want to talk about is yeast infection, candidasis. Uh, sometimes we call it thrush. Now, the interesting thing about fungal STDs is well, like the yeast infection, is that it can affect all different parts of your body. It tends to affect uh, parts of your body that are more moist, you know, more, tend to be a bit more, you know, humid. But it can definitely affect any part of your body. So some of the most common parts that are affected would be <coughs> the genitals, toes, uh, mouth, and so on. And most infections will just cause uh, redness, itching, and discomfort. And you can treat these by you know, using antifungal drugs and creams and things like that. Then there's a few different kinds of parasites that are typically transmitted through sex. Um, there's crabs, you know, crab louse, which will cause sometimes intense itching in the privates. Uh, the reason why uh, it tends to only be located to the privates is because crab louse, you know, crabs, they need to have that kind of hair to live in. So pubic hair is fundamentally different from the hair anywhere else on your body, and they can only really infest that kind of hair. So one of the easiest ways to eliminate a crab louse infestation or to prevent one is simply to shave off the pubic hair. But you certainly don't have to worry about getting crabs like in your, you know, facial hair or on top of your head or anything like that because, like I said, it's different. Uh, another kind of uh, parasite that's a little similar but it, it has different, you know, effects would be scabies. Sometimes call it the seven-year itch. The scabies can cause intense, <coughs> intense itching in a distinct pattern of rash, rashes on the skin. And the thing about scabies is 
they can happen anywhere on the body. Then you have protozoal STDs. Um, the one that we talk about the most, the one that you're probably familiar with, is trichomoniasis, or trick. This will infect the human genital tract and produce pain, like a burning or an itching, during intercourse or urination. Now the thing about trick is that men don't have that much to worry about. Men will just naturally kind of expel this protozoal uh, STD through normal urination. So if, if you're a male and you contract this, it'll probably be gone in about 14 days. Women, however, because you know the pipes are different, women need to seek treatment. It's not going to be expelled just naturally. But of course, the kind of STDs that we tend to be the most concerned about, that we talk the most about, that tend to have the worst effects are the viral STDs. Some are relatively minor, you know, like genital warts. That's one example of a viral STD that will produce growths on the genitals. And that can be asymptomatic for many years, in fact. But like I said, it's kind of minor. It's not going to really, you know, do any serious damage. It just makes you uncomfortable, basically. But then you have other, more serious viral STDs like HPV, human papilloma. Papilloma virus, papilloma, yeah, um, which will cause growths on the genitals. And herpes simplex virus, you know, HSV, which can cause painful blisters on the genitals. And the scary thing about it is that it is highly contagious, and we don't really have a cure for it right now. But, of course, the one that's considered perhaps the most serious, the one that's the most, you know, worrisome would be the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV which is a sexually transmitted virus which will eventually produce AIDS. AIDS stands for the acquired immune deficiency syndrome and it is definitely caused by HIV. Now the thing about AIDS, the reason why we you know we're, we're so anxious about it, the reason why we take such steps to you know talk about it and try to avoid it is because it is almost always fatal. If you contract AIDS, your, your time left is very limited. The reason why it's fatal is because the AIDS itself doesn't kill you, but what the AIDS does is it weakens you. It makes your immune system, you know, to be very inefficient, to be very ineffective, so that just other diseases, you know, common diseases, things that uh, healthy people would be able to contract and get rid of in just a couple of days, these really mundane diseases can do serious damage to somebody with AIDS. So when you get AIDS, it basically just weakens you and makes you more likely to suffer more from other diseases. Your, your white blood cell count is dangerously lower. When it comes to your risk of contracting an SA STD, we know that there's many important factors that you know, either increase or decrease your risk. Uh, one of the most obvious ones is protection. You know, having unprotected sex, not using a condom, not using any other kind of protection. If your partner has that STD, you're very likely to contract it. Now, even if you use protection, that's not a guarantee. So there's other important factors as well, like, you know, having sex with multiple people at the same time or mul you know, multiple people individually in a short period of time or having sex with people that you don't know or somebody that you know has lots of partners or sex with somebody you know who injects drugs you know, somebody who shares needles because a lot of STDs, especially like HIV that can be transmitted through the blood. It can be transmitted through body fluids other than sexual contact. So when it comes to trying to reduce your amount of risk, there's certain things that you could potentially do. Uh, first of all, you could never have sex. That is actually something that's advocated by many people in this country. But the, ba the sad truth about that is abstinence-only education just doesn't seem to work. In just looking at it, just looking at the statistics, the regions of this country that advocate abstinence-only education 
tend to have higher birth rates and higher rates of STD prevalence. So just being completely impartial, being completely scientific, just looking at the numbers, it clearly seems that we simply cannot stop having sex. So a more realistic solution, uh, a more you know, natural solution would be to have one partner that you're mutually faithful. That just means you're not going to cheat on them and they're not going to cheat on you. Obviously, if neither one of you ever has sex with anyone else, it's impossible for you to contract an STD or give an STD to this person. Uh, if you're in such a relationship, you should also avoid in, in injecting drugs of any kind. Um, because obviously, if somebody else used that needle before you, and they had something like HIV, you could get it in that way. Uh, beyond simply being mutually faithful, if you do want to have sex with many different kinds of people, then you should always discuss contraception. So, like I said earlier, it's not a 100% guarantee that you'll avoid contracting an STD, but it does significantly reduce your risk by using some kind of uh, safe sex con contraception. But perhaps the best word of advice I can give you if you are currently dating is just be very selective when it comes to choosing a sexual partner. You obviously, you know, even though that, you know, really attractive girl might seem nice, if you know that she's had lots of sex with lots of different people, that's obviously going to increase your chances of getting some kind of an STD. So you should just try to get to know the person, try to figure out, try to learn about their sexual history and try to learn about their sexual habits before you take that plunge. Besides sexually transmitted diseases, there's also a whole long list of different kinds of other problems that can occur related to sexual interaction. These are different kinds of sex disorders or sexual dysfunctions. So you have disorders of your sexual desire, of your ability to become aroused, of your ability to reach orgasm, and the feeling of pain during sexual interaction. So when I'm talking about sexual desire disorders, I'm basically talking about one of two things, either being too into it or not enough. So if you're too into it, that's hypersexuality, or sometimes we call it nymphomania. That's when you have extremely frequent or suddenly increased sexual urges. And this can be caused by many things. It can have psychogenic causes, so that just means, you know, like your mental state drives you to this. But it can also be caused by drugs and other things as well. If you are on the other hand, if you don't want it enough, then that would be hyposexual desire or hypoactive sexual desire. That's just when you have a persistent and upsetting loss of sexual desire. And that kind of hypoactive sex desire, it is sometimes confused with asexuality. This is what I was mentioning in the previous video when I said that, you know, asexuality, not being interested in either sex, is ex so extremely uncommon, you'll probably never meet an asexual person. People who think that they're asexual it might simply be that they have a hypoactive sex desire. So they do find uh, people of one or both genders attractive, and they are attracted to, you know, one or the other, but they just aren't, you know, feeling it. They just don't have that urge to engage in sexual activity. It might be due to psychogenic causes or other kinds of causes. But one of the most common ones is uh, what we call sexual aversion. So just ha being, having some kind of fear or anxiety or disgust regarding sexual interaction. So if you have a sex aversion, that'll keep you away from engaging in sex act sexual activity. But it's not like you don't want it. It's not like it's not an important thing to you. It's just for whatever reason, you've associated this kind of behavior with upsetting things. Like maybe you were traumatized as a child, so now every time you think about sex, it makes you feel sick or something like that. These are things that can definitely be treated by going to see you know, a counselor or psychotherapist or a psychiatrist. 
when I'm talking about arousal disorders, one of the more you know common topics there would be male arousal disorder, or sometimes you just call it erectile disorder or erectile dysfunction. Uh, you could also call it impotence. This is just when a male cannot maintain an erection. A, m a male has you know an inability to maintain that erection for the duration of the lovemaking. And as I keep saying, these things can be caused by the psychogenic factors, you know, your state of mind. And because of that, you can treat a lot of these kinds of disorders through, you know, going to see a counselor and having different kinds of therapy that focus on these psychological factors. Uh, females can also have sexual arousal disorders where they're just not interested, basically and that has the same basic causes and treatments. When it comes to orgasmic disorders, there's different directions that the men and women go. With women, uh, the problem they tend to have regarding or orgasm is not being able to reach it uh, during normal sexual intercourse. And the upsetting thing for the woman can be that even if she's really into it, even if she really likes the guy, for whatever reason, she just can't reach orgasm. Maybe he's just it could be that he's just not pushing the buttons, or maybe he's just not trying hard enough. That's one possible reason. But for whatever reason, you know, she's just unable. Uh, the good news for a lot of these women is even if they are completely unable to reach orgasm during sex, most often they can do, they definitely can reach orgasm through masturbation, so manual stimulation of the genitals. So all, my, all I would say is, if you're in a relationship and your boyfriend is, you know, incapable of doing this for you, you should try, you know, masturbation instead. You might find that much more gratifying. With males, the problem they tend to have regarding orgasm is that they reach it too quickly. So premature ejaculation is the primary orgasmic problem men have. And you definitely see this very often in younger men. So that, this is just referring to ejaculating, like persistently ejaculating before the man or his partner want, want to, that to happen. And the advice I have for you, if you are having this problem, is, well, there's many psychological things you can do, but the basic technique you want to use is called the squeeze technique where you lit it's exactly what it sounds like you inhibit ejaculation by compressing the tip of the penis and then finally when it comes to sexual pain disorders this is something that we much more often associate with women than men men just typically don't experience pain of any kind whereas women some women in fact experience pain every time that they have sex and that's extremely unfortunate. A lot of women, in fact, believe sex is pain. Like, that's, that's their life experience. They, didn't, they never really realized that it could be any other way. And what I'm telling you, if you're a woman who always feels pain during sex, that's not normal. That's dyspneuria. It's general pain before, during, or after intercourse, and that's a disorder. You can get that treated. You should talk to somebody about it. Go to your doctor and explain what's happening and hopefully you can get some treatment for that. Now there's, like I said, there's many different ways, there's many different possible causes, but one of the more um, painful kinds of, you know, sex pain disorders is vaginismus, where this is a condition where muscle spasms in the vagina make penetration by the penis or other things to be difficult, painful, or impossible. So like I said, if you're experiencing any pain during sexual intercourse and you're certain you don't have any STDs, you should go see a doctor. 